yours. Oh my God, I, that is so totally unexpected. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all, welcome to you all. Thank you for that beautiful ovation. Oh my God. A very well-deserved ovation I, for mm. someone who has um, been an inspiration and a mentor to so many artists, so many curators, and especially for Valerie Cassell Oliver and myself, who could not have been more thrilled, happy, um, inspired, and even daunted to take on the project of trying to present over 50 years of this magnificent work. We're gonna have a, just a wonderful, casual conversation today. Um, we're gonna go through the work, some of which you've seen upstairs, I hope. Um, and we're gonna open it up for some questions a little later on. Um, but first, I want to just take a moment to thank Valerie uh, again who uh, was one of my inspirations as a curator, uh, someone who I've looked up to for years. And so, uh, it's hard. This is it's about to, to get really emotional. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this journey. And cannot thank you enough, Howardina, for entrusting Naomi and I to truly be able to tell your story and to bring this to life and to manifest. Um, and it is always hard to come into someone else's home and to work, but I would like to thank Naomi for the invitation and to the MCA for welcoming me uh, with such generosity and for all the resources and love that has gone into this project. I think you can even see it in the way that it's installed. There's a lot, even the crew, the installation crew, was so generous of spirit and of time. Uh, as they put this work on the walls for you to enjoy and to see. So, Howardina, a true testament to you. Oh, thank you so much. Really. Yeah. This is the best museum experience I've ever had after yeah. working for <laughs> 12 years in one. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about some other kind of museum experiences a little <laughs> later on. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't always that way. This is true. So we uh we thought because many of you may not know the arc of Howardina's career and story, we just start from the beginning. Um, Howardina, you graduated from Yale in 1967. Remember the 60s? Yeah, during the Vietnam War. Barely. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about your experiences as a student there, and also what were you learning at that time? Well, Oh, it was odd. Um, <laughs> uh, Yale at that point had no women undergraduate students. So when you went to a lecture, you know, when you attended a class, they would say lady and gentleman. And it was a little tricky finding ladies' rooms. Um, the graduate programs were um, integrated with, with women, but I, there were just a handful of us on campus. Um, the education, uh, it was the School of Art and Architecture, and it was very rigorous. Uh, and also, um, I would say fairly sexist. Um, just simply, one of the luminaries at that point was Al Held, and he was really mean. Uh, so I never signed up for a crit with him, and he ignored me also. Uh, I had a crit with, um, well, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, and she walked into my studio and turned around. I was a figurative artist then and said, ugh, this was done in the Renaissance. Well, I got my, um, shall we say, comeuppance, or not comeuppance, I, my revenge, I think that's the <laughs> word for it. <laughs> because when I was um, on the curatorial staff at the Modern, uh, they were doing an exhibition of her work as a joint venture between the Modern and the Whitney, and I was the curatorial person representing the Modern. So when I went to visit her, I thought she'd faint. <laughs> you know, that was the last place she expected to find me. <laughs> anyway, um, but anyhow, Yale, the best experience I think there was uh, studying color, um, learning from Joseph Albers. And he, at that point, had had a, an argument with the school. So his protege taught the course. And we took the course with architects, which um, opened my mind you know, to another kind of, um, of thinking. 
Uh, and also, of course, that whole New York men mentality. I'm not really like into the art world, if you know what I mean. Um, the graduate students, um, a number of the uh, young men, their aim was get a show in New York, get a gar, uh, a, a, a um, get a, a, a loft, and make it. Um, and it was like El Held was the gateway for them. So you had this kind of hardline group that w were pro New York. I didn't want to go to New York. Um, I mean, I ended up there by default, but there was this kind of um, cold, harsh kind of art world patina on the program. Some of the teachers reflected that, like Al Held, and some of them didn't, like uh, Lester Johnson and um, uh, Bernard Chait. Bernard Chait was my advisor, and he was really wonderful to me. So I, I don't have any complaint there. It was just, you know, a bizarre environment to be a woman of color also because I don't know. There might have been three of us on campus. You know, there were very, very... In the entire university. Yeah. In the entire university. Wow. Now, possibly there were other kind of more remote departments where there were people of color. But um, one of the things was the law school had the best... best um, um, program for you know their their restaurant or whatever and so you could from different departments go there and have a meal and I believe I was the only black person there have you know a, ha, having a meal plan so it was it was pretty um, yeah it, it was pretty isolating um, in terms of the sexism uh, when you had a crit and I, I think that's it's in the catalog where I talk about how as a woman if you used pink if you used red and white, it would be referred to, if you were a woman artist, as pink, and you shouldn't use pink. But if there was a white male artist who used pink, it was referred to as red and white. So the language itself um, could be very loaded. And uh, I felt kind of a hostility towards the kind of New York mentality that was there and was kind of um, worried when it ended up that I, my father was angry at me because I couldn't get a job. He was kind of naive about the art world because um, women in general and people of color were not getting teaching jobs. Um, the, some of the young men in my class who eventually didn't graduate, they got jobs, but not the women. And while I was at Yale, I worked at the museum uh, in the Garvin Collection and art history was my minor. And it was because I had museum training or whatever. I did nothing, you know, it was grunt work. Um, so when I went to the museum on a whim, I mean, I was looking for work everywhere. There was one job I was offered in Philadelphia for 3500 a year to work as a kind of um, nursemaid at a, uh, a very upscale uh, white women's private school called the Baldwin School and what was required that you live with the students. So you really had no life. You were, I was like, no way, no way. Um, so I was in, I had a membership at the Modern and I passed the business entrance. I thought, oh, why don't I just go in and you know, sign up in personnel. And a woman had just quit her job, literally, as an exhibition as assistant in the department of circulating exhibitions, which sent exhibitions around to different campuses, um, and they were curated shows, often by curators who were not on staff. And the person who first interviewed me was um, an Asian woman who was head of personnel. She sent me to the department uh, of circulating exhibition, and the first person to interview me there was Victor Smythe, who eventually became one of the curators at the Schomburg. He was um, Panamanian American, and um, he said, you know, a young woman just quit a job. She hated it. I want you to interview for it. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I met a woman named Inez Garson who interviewed me. Who She's a wonderful woman. She uh, eventually became a curator at the Hirschhorn. And her assistant eventually became the attorney for um, one of the um, major women's uh, groups. And they, she said to me, if you can wait a month, this has not been put out into public, we have to announce this position, and I'll let you know in a month if you have the job. So um, a friend of a friend, because I had no money, um, offered to let me stay in her apartment in Flushing. Those of you who know New York, that's quite a trip. And um, that I didn't need to pay rent um, until I found a job. 
and within a month they called me and said, you're hired. Um, but then the museum, the head of the museum uh, was uh, Rene Donancourt, uh, who was massive. He must have been like seven feet tall. And he was like European royalty, but nice European royalty. <laughs> <laughs> And he was, uh, he was just really a lovely person. And he got hit by a car. I can't imagine a car doing any damage to him. And he, he killed him. And the museum became a corporation. They got rid of the woman in personnel and hired a Barbie doll. Um, and the new director, Bates Lowry, ended up spending thousands of dollars renovating his offices. He got rid of my department. He got rid of the kind of really um, public mandate to, to have an educational apartment that reached out to the, the community. He got rid of that. And so it became a more corp corporate venture, which it has continued to be uh, through time. The only new director, they went through a lot of them, uh, who really seemed to have a soul, I'm sorry to be so insulting, but um, was a man named John Hightower. So it was kind of like a roller coaster working there. I had a boss who was really mean. Um, and we went on strike twice. We started a union. And, um, you know, I got to curate shows um, both from my department in terms of uh, prints and illustrated books. Early on, it was drawings and illustrated books. And I did project shows. Um, there's a piece by one of the artists, Charles Simmons, in the museum here. Um, I haven't seen his work for many years. Um, and after uh, 12 years of it, and after we were talking uh, backstage about the occurrence of a, a white male artist doing a uh, show that he titled Nigger Drawings, and uh, the show was of black charcoal drawings, but it was abstract. So if you called and asked them, you know, if you called and asked them what is the show about, uh, they would say, oh, well, it's in charcoal, and um, bl uh, charcoal is black, and black is nigger. And so that started um, a movement um, against that kind of um, thinking. Uh, we, Howard Dana. Yeah, I want to back up just a little bit, because I want to I dwell on that for a while, but I realize so far we haven't even spoken about your art yet. Oh, okay. So we've now just gone through 12 years <laughs> of your career as a curator, so I want to start talking about uh, okay. art too, because you were a practicing artist yes, in this time. Yes, I was. I had two resumes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Naomi is absolutely right. I mean, you jump straight from Yale into curatorial practice, and there is something very specific about the time that you get to New York, and you are working, and you are continuing your artistic practice. There's a moment in which you're now in a studio, which is very different from any studio you've worked before. Yeah. And how did that change your practice and change your work? Well, you know, actually, I know I always say this, but the racism at the museum is what helped me with my art practice because I got left out of a lot of things. You know, any kind of um, social obligations, you know, there were private parties uh, that were staff connected or um, some of the trustees having events, whatever, I was not included. So it meant I had a lot of work time. And um, the best uh, work situation that I actually have ever had was in a loft at 28th Street and 7th Avenue across from FIT. I had uh, 2,300 square feet of space. It was a st square space. It was illegal. And <laughs> <laughs> most, uh, most artists lived illegally, you know? in lofts and um, I could go home and I had all of this wonderful space for $600. No, no, that's when I left, $125 including heat. And that was, I mean, that space now is six, six 7,000 a month or more. Um, anyway, so it gave me the time, although I was pissed off, um, it gave me the time to really develop my own, genre, you know, my own thoughts. And one of the things that was helpful about the museum being staffed, you could go into the galleries when the public was not there. And so I would wander around a lot and see the collection, plus uh, hands-on um, in terms of doing like condition reports and being exposed to a lot of artists' work. Plus they gave you a day off for uh, visiting artists and also going to galleries. Yeah, so there were to some- To reinstitute that, just saying. <laughs> 
But what were you making at that time? Well, oh God, let me think. The, the grid that you see upstairs, the soft grid, the, it's like 12 by 12. Um, I lived in West Beth Artist Housing for a while, and I had like a living loft, which was tiny, and then they gave me a workspace to share, and it was in that space that I started really uh, moving away totally from figuration, okay? Um, I started, um, I believe, doing some of the space frame drawings. Um, I just felt, you know, as a figurative painter, I was becoming more expressionist, um, but I started to consider other ideas. Uh, like when I was at Yale, I saw Ad Reinhardt's work and the close value color, and that influenced me a lot. And in fact, Boston University, where I, I attended for undergraduate, um, they brought Ad Reinhardt to school as a visiting artist. So I got to hear him speak. But I was kind of amazed in, in retrospect that they brought him because they had so much contempt for abstraction. So that when I um, got into Yale, they stopped talking to me. And uh, one of another student, uh, Dina Udell, who has since passed away, she got into their um, a graphic arts program. So I guess they didn't talk to two of us. <laughs> Anyhow. But the work, um, let's talk about the time that you move away from the soft grid. I mean, the grid is a reoccurring. Yeah, that was um, a big jump for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I started, I, I became very enamored by the circle. Um, I remember there was a gra it was a catalyst for me. One of the graduate students, uh, Nancy Murata, um, started working with circles, and it suddenly was like boom. You know, this was like oh my god, and I'm still obsessed with the circle. You know, I mean, in those days you couldn't buy a hole puncher except at Woolworths. Um, you know, and the hole punches were maybe a half an inch round, and I. For some reason, I don't know, I, th I see when you do your work, there's a play aspect of it, that you have fun with the work. And um, I started taking file folders, you know, I could go to Walt Woolworths and buy the manila folders, and then I would just punch them out and cut them in strips. S some of them are upstairs in the show. I'd glue them together, and then for some reason, I have no idea why, I took uh, unprimed canvas and I would spray layers and layers and layers of dots. Uh, using acrylic uh, paint. At the time, they sold this kind of gizmo that was, was an aerosol can with a little cap that attached to a bottle. And you would put water retention breaker and also you'd thin down your acrylic paint and it would spray. It would act like if I used a compressor. I bought a compressor, but it was just too much for me to deal with. So I just used this kind of rinky-dink method. And I would just, um, I think in the catalog, it shows me where I've pinned up a template. I would spray through it, but I never throw anything out. Those who know me and know how I live, I never throw anything out. And um, my dealer, Garth Grennan, bless his soul, um, has, um, he covers some of my storage. I mean, I have to have storage <laughs> because otherwise. Um, anyway, so I kept bags of little circles. And Carl Soloway had come to see my work, this is while I was still at West Beth, and he said to me, how many circles are on the canvas? I thought, hmm. And I started counting the dots. Now, my father was a mathematician. That was his, his first degree was from Morgan State in mathematics. And I would see him writing in a book which had a kind of graph paper. Whenever we traveled, he would write down, because they don't have this in the car anymore, um, in the cars, but an odometer, I think is what it's really called. I call it a speedometer. Um, They're still there. They still have them. They still have it? Yes. <laughs> I don't drive. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I would be the worst driver in the world. Um, but anyway, he would write these numbers down so he would know what number he started with and what number was next when he arrived. And so he would have these books with, in fact, I did, um, somewhere in my slides, I did uh, take a slide of some of his books. Um, and so I saw, see, I, I can barely count to 10. And I love drawing numbers. I see it as drawing. And I'm not necessarily seeing it as having anything to do with critical thinking or anything rational. I just like drawing the numbers. And why I started putting on graph paper, I remember I had a kind of almost hostile reaction to the grid. And that may be why I would kind of like use it a lot. Uh, because um, at the time, New York was, you know, just 
you know, everything. It was like minimal and it was, you know, the grid and whatever. Um, and that's why I did the soft grid. It was supposed to be a portable grid that you could carry around with you. Anyway, so that was my, you know, idea behind it. And then the work gradually changed where, you know, I started then sprinkling the dots on the templates. Now the, not templates, on the amount which I would get from, well, I negotiated with the head of the frame shop at the museum that I could take home their, their trash. And the trash meant they would cut these elaborately beautiful beveled mats and they throw away the inside, the in, you know, the window part, the inside, like the donut hole. And um, I said, I really want to take these home. And they said, sure, you know, so I'd raid their trash and take those home. And then I started, now, um, the, f the first salary I got at the Modern was a whopping 5000 a year. And in two years, I got a lovely letter from the trustees giving me a $5 raise, <laughs> you know. I mean, the, the salaries were pitiful. Um, but anyway, so I took home the beveled mounts, and I had plenty of sewing thread because I couldn't afford to buy clothes, so I'd make my own clothes. Um, and I would slit, s put like notches, and then I just wrapped the thread or just pulled it, you know, so it would keep. And then I started uh, sprinkling. I have no idea why I was sprinkling it. But um, it was the grid. The grid was still, the you would create the grid there. with the, the thread. A very rigid grid, yeah, using different color thread. And then I had these numbered spots and I started spraying. Um, I called or really contacted GM. I think, when was it GM? No, 3M. 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 And they sent a guy with a little suitcase to my loft and I told him what I wanted to do and he was very, very respectful and he recommended spray photo dry mount. So I started spraying and sprinkling, spraying and sprinkling, and then like when I first came to New York uh, and started working for the museum, the first, one of the first openings I went to was um, work uh, by Eva Hesse. She was still alive. And I remembered loving the, the way the patina of her work, the, the latex pieces, and so I started using powders uh, because I didn't like the kind of rubbery look of the spray. You know, and I, then I just went on this journey, you know, where I was, you know, putting things down one by one. Didn't bother me in the least. You know, you would think you'd get bored with it, but um, I bought a TV. Someone said because I was at, you know, I was really working close on a little circle, uh, you know, with a pen and a rapidograph, one by one. <laughs> and so I have actually there's a picture somewhere. I can't remember whether I saw it in the catalog or not, where there are two TVs. And so I would turn the TV on, put it way at a distance, and then I could look up and look at something that was moving at a distance. And that's better for your eyes than just, you know, doing that all the time. You just described a wonderful process of how these beautiful works on paper came to the fore. And you actually started doing this on canvas as well. Uh, now, yeah. this has been many years in the making, this exhibition, but there's a question that I've never asked you, which is, how long does it take you to do these large canvas works, yeah. such as Dutch wish, Wise, which is upstairs, which is nine feet in one length, and covered and sprinkled and with paint and powder and glue? I was by myself. I lifted them. I was strong. I was young. They took me two months. Now they take me five months. You know, and now actually, because I can't work on the floor anymore, I attach each, each circle one by one. Mm. You know, and I'm really into it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanna know how you got to really cutting and suturing these pieces I together. Don't know. I never thought of quilts. I just simply thought of the grid. And I cut, I remember, a strip of canvas and another strip and I just started weaving weaving it but that was really heavy you know and that's why I kind of backed off and then would take the canvas and grid it cut it and sew it you know so I didn't have like a double weight canvas because it was really hard you know to move it around um I just forgot my question I was so obsessed with the grid <laughs> <laughs> well yeah actually I wanted to go back to the point that you just made about buying a television because that started a new body of work yep, as well. The video drawings. I thought TV is so boring. TV is still so boring. <laughs> Very boring. Very boring. Um, anyhow, so I just, I don't know, again, it's play. 
Now, I could think of, some of you, I don't know, you're probably not in my generation, but there was something that may actually still exist. It's called Etch-a-Sketch. Oh, yeah. Remember? <laughs> and the, so what you did was, you know, you put it and you draw and then you lift it. Well, that lifting that reminded me, gee, why don't I try drawing with um, acetate ink on, um, you know, mylar, and you turn on the TV and the static attaches the drawing to the TV. Uh, and then I cut out little sections and cut, I could shift them around if I wanted. And then I found, although I am not athletic, I mean, I can barely walk up the stairs, um, even when I was younger, but I was strong to do the work, which I find interesting. Um, I just found that it was the f sports that really worked with that method of vectors and numbers. But then there were other things, you know, like I started in getting interested in like uh, Metropolis, the movie. Um, then there was one with a flying saucer. Um, actually, someone, an artist that I knew, became one of the top UFO investigators, which I think is funny. In fact, there, there's a painting in the, the show that was in a show that he did called The UFO Show. The yellow one is, f yeah, about that. It's like a galaxy. I'm terrified of UFOs. Oh, God. No, from what he told me, God forbid they should land, you know? <laughs> Whoa. You know, we're either lunch or, you know, uh, pets or, <laughs> you know, you know, material to make a hybrid. I, whew. Anyway, so <laughs> I try to keep my head off that subject. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, okay. Uh <laughs> hey, they were seen in an airport. It was, they were seen here in Chicago airport years ago. Ah. Okay, so the Tao of physics oh. uh, okay. on the other side of the UFOs is um, this idea, the esoteric notion of Zen and movement and the idea of the vectors. I mean, we have upstairs really beautiful some of the stencils, um, the templates, the acetate templates, mm -hmm. along with the book. Do you want to talk about how you came to know the book and and then this idea well, of then this it was vector kind of drawings. Almost what would you call it? A um, oh my God! It was like a book that you, for somehow uh, the artists were reading it, mm -hmm. and I was reading it visually. I mean, reading the text too, but the cover, and those are traces from the cyclotron with colliding particles, and I just looked at that and I thought that's incredible. There was something about the movement the linear side of it, and just the drama of the col collision of the particles. And that is one thing that got me started on making vectors. And then the numbers just came from, you know, my father. Um, but that book was very important to me. It, it was an interesting, we had a press conference yesterday, and I don't know if Candida is here, um, but she brought up a very interesting idea about circularity, the circles, and the vectors, and how Perhaps there is this this movement of understanding space, three dimensionality very differently in a in a two dimensional frame. And I wonder if that was that sort of um, a through line in the work, or I you know I see the video drawings as being in somewhat separate. Although one could almost say they're diagrams for moves that I make in the paintings. You know the kind of energy and motion. And um, my friend, who's my archivist, he was here, he just left this morning. Um, he, when we went through the show yesterday, he said, oh my God, Howardina, the space frame pieces are like a two-dimensional version of what you developed er later, where you took those circles and ellipses and whatever, and the grid, and made the grid thread. You made it three-dimensional, then you made the dots three-dimensional, and so they are like a road map to what I did later. Absolutely. And I had never seen it that way. Mm. You know, it was like physicalizing what was on in two dimensions into three dimensions. Yeah, I, I thank him for that. I, I really had not thought of that at all. Yeah. It's also a great example of what it means to work intuitively through yeah. a project and a yeah. problem that you don't have to necessarily articulate as an artist, yes. but you sort of work at it to create mm -hmm. this massive body of work. Mm -hmm. So now, 
we're back to 1979. <laughs> You've caught us back up. Oh, Lord. Um, okay. So as you were to, beginning to describe through this dual life mm -hmm. as an artist working 12 years out of Yale and as a curator working 12 years out of Yale, all of a sudden there's a moment downtown. Well, okay. Um, I left my job at the museum because I was tired of people looking at the Nigger Drawing Show as an issue of censorship on my part. Um, so what happened when you heard about the show? Or well, I do? called, oh, I just called up all my friends. I called up Lowry, I called up Lucy Lepard, I, you know, um, and it was like, what should we do? So we decided, um, also Camille Billups was very active. We had a teach-in. Uh, we, when we first went to the gallery, um, uh, David Hammonds had come to my uh, loft, and I think he brought a friend, and we made banners. And uh, we went to, um, I think it was in Tribeca at that point, and uh, artist Spurs uh, called the police and shut down uh, the show. Then we went back again, and they let us in, but then a friend who was an artist of the director looked at us, and we were multicultural, and said, how dare you come down here and tell us what to do? We are a white neighborhood, or this is a white neighborhood. And so I was thinking, you know, God forbid, I can't deal with this. I, you know, I'm in a museum where the general talk was that this was an issue of censorship on our part. And then I found out later that Artist Space had gotten, because it was an alternative space and it was funded by um, probably the NEA, and uh, when the NEA could fund them, the NEA and the New York State Council. And what they did with, they had been given money for outreach, um, and they spent it on bringing artists in from Scotland. So that was their idea of outreach, I guess, the longer distance, whatever. <laughs> Anyhow. So, you know, we, it was the sort of thing that led me on the track of wanting to put everything in writing because I, it was like I was holding this tiger inside, so to speak. I was like really pissed off because I saw it. I had been on the juries for the NEA. I had you know, served on them. I had served on juries for the New York State Council. And what I saw were black institutions, Latino institutions, Asian institutions, Native American institutions had this huge hoop they had to keep jumping through to get funding year after year. And that the white institutions, including Artist Space, were guaranteed money they would get, they were guaranteed a certain amount of money. And of course, I'm sure they could approach for more, but they were already, in a sense, vested. And yet the uh, spaces which were run by people of color had to keep going through this routine over and over and over again. So I got really annoyed, you know, with that kind of thing. And so I started, well, one thing I did that, I don't know if it's in the catalog or not, um, when I was still at the Modern, I would write letters and I would sign them the Black Hornet. Now, they had no idea. That's the next superhero movie. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw Black Panther last night. It was fabulous. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Oh, my God. Anyway, but what I did is I would call the museums up. This is when I would call as myself. And I was no longer working in the museum. I was I? No, I was no longer working there. And I, I wanted to get their um, press releases and checklists. And um, the key resource was Art in America. You know, every August, I don't know if they still do it. I don't have a subscription <laughs> anymore. But every August, they would list all the galleries. And the galleries themselves said who they represented. It wasn't like I made up who they represented. They themselves committed in writing to the public who they represented. And I went through and I looked at the gallery list. I, I stuck with New York because it was like I couldn't do all the cities. And then I could note, you know, like um, a Nina Noise gallery was 100% male and 100% white. Um, so I went through that and then I published this document, you know, um, by myself. And it's actually in a catalog that's in the bookstore here. Um, the catalog is um, from the Brooklyn Muse Museum show and it's called We Wanted a Revolution. And in that, I was stunned. They didn't ask me, you know. They published it. I was so relieved because I had the original document, but I thought, you know, will anyone ever see this, you know? And they they published it practically in its original form, including letters, you know, from different people and all the statistics. Um, and then I had one book uh, that's I think on Amazon. It's called 
it was the heart of the question. And I don't know how much she edited it, but it has a number of my writings about these issues concerning censorship and also um, the uh, amount of, actually, really, uh, it's marginalization. I mean, when you think of New York City, New York City's over 50% um, non-white, but the institutions are geared towards only a small segment of the population, although the population is paying, a whole population is paying taxes. You know, there's this guaranteed money uh, that these institutions get. Anyhow. Well, I know we want to get to post-1979, or, or really the pivotal moments that happened in 79 that oh, set the course for, yeah. Well, I was, um, I, I got a job at Stony Brook University. I've been there now 37 years. And um, I think it was about a month into being there, I was in this very bad car accident. I don't drive, as you can well imagine. Uh, I was in the back seat, sitting sideways. It's a good thing I was, otherwise my hips would have been broken. And um, the driver was the art critic, Donald Cuspit, who was chairman. And then there was a woman who uh, was a critic. I had a show at the school, and she was coming out. And a woman, um, actually an ex-nun, so that we would say, you know, it's an act of God. Uh, she crossed the medium strip into oncoming traffic. And we were fortunately slowing down. And we were in a VW bug, she was in a big car. So I ended up with, um, you know, if you look, I'm kind of bald here, I ended up with a head injury. Uh, and then my hips were injured in that they were misaligned. Um, that's more or less corrected now. Um, but it changed my view. And that's when my work became autobiographical. Um, it, the accident was in 79 and Free White in 21 was in 1980. And I suddenly got my voice because my general feeling was, you know, you could wake up tomorrow and you're dead. Um, I know that's a contradiction, but. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, you know, I just, um, I just started doing like, um, it's amazing. There was a painting I did, because I've done a lot of traveling, and it was about um, wife burning in India. I've, I've been to India about four months worth. And um, I saw on the temple's hands, and I found out that if a woman was burned alive on her hu husband's funeral pyre, that they would trace her hand and then make it a kind of relief. Um, and that kind of appalled me. Apparently it's still going on in smaller areas. And there are um, cases where if a woman doesn't bring a high enough dowry, they'll burn her. Uh, and I was like, like horrified. So that was one of my earlier paintings, which were about my experience of the knowledge of this. So I lay down on the canvas, um, and that partly was from the accident. It was also partly because of Andi, Anna Mendieta was one of my friends. And so when she was, um, we believe Carl killed her, because that night she asked for a divorce. That's what her sister said. Um, her body was on a roof, and they, like a crime scene, you know, they traced the body. So I lay down on the canvas and traced my body, and then I put hands in, um, in the canvas, and I painted it like a fire color. And I kept saying, no one's going to buy this. You know, this is horrible. And the first painting that got sold was that one. Wow. And the family that bought it, I met them yesterday. Oh. Isn't that sweet? They came. They came. I've, and I've always been thinking of them, like, oh, who are they? Who, who would buy this? You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and they love the painting. Well, Any not only is it lovely, but this is you also returning to including the human figure yeah. in yes. the work. Yes. And how was that transition for you, going from abstraction and numbers into figuration? It was very comfortable. I think because I was working in the past, so far in the past, with the figure. And uh, I was incorporating my figure. Uh, I basically was not incorporating anyone else's figure, but I would um, be kind of a surrogate for someone else. Uh, for example, uh, how dare you question? All of those are my figure. Uh, you know, and I would just lay down in dif different positions on the canvas. One of the ones that I think is interesting in terms of when you do a tracing, you don't know what the results will be. In the painting scapegoat, um, the Studio Museum owns it. Um, you'll see at the bottom a the head of a child, and it's in black silhouette. I put my head on a canvas, and that's what showed up. 
and it painted it black, and this was long before the whole Kara Walker controversy. So it was like, I never used silhouettes. And then suddenly there's this silhouette. I mean, I have a problem with premonitions in my work. And so I like the, the weather map piece was done before Katrina. I was like intensely, I had to do a weather map. So I have stuff like that that shows up. I remember in Scapegoat, there are three heads, me um, younger and older, and there's a third head. I couldn't get him out of the painting. He was an old boyfriend that I left, and I couldn't get his head out of the painting. So I just left it there. <laughs> hmm. <Okay. laughs> non sequitur. Um, well, do you want to talk about, I mean, I love getting to autobiography because it is the reoccurrence of the figure. And one thing that we notice too is that over the arc of your career, you return to many different themes in the work. Um, I want to get to the accident and this idea of memory and bringing things back to the fore. Um, all right, uh, the memory, I mean, I still have memory problems. Um, uh, what I had was, uh, it was hard for me to remember my friends, the sound of their voices. I had face recognition problems. And I found that I started to split things and paint in between. It was like the fractured mind. And I would, I was using postcards at that point because the postcards reminded me of where I had picked up the postcard. My mother had a postcard collection also, you know, so I, and people were starting to send me postcards. Like when I was doing the dots, people were starting to send me dots. Uh, anyway, so I would cut the postcards and then I would join them and try to make it so you couldn't tell what was painted and what was the postcard. And so it was almost like I was trying to knit my brain back together again. And then the postcards then jumped to my taking because I had taken photography at Yale. Um, I started taking my own photographs, of course, when I was traveling, mainly slides and um, some black and white. And then I could control the scale with um, postcards. You're stuck with the scale of the postcard. But with your own uh, images, you can make it different sizes. But it was still the same issue of connecting one section to another and trying to make it look like it was perfect, but it wasn't, it was weird, you know? And I enjoyed do doing those things. I don't know if I'm really into doing that work again, um, but I, you know, and I, I don't do that much traveling anymore, so I don't have the kind of uh, resource of images, you know, that I, to, to pick from. But it was a part of my, I think, healing process. Interesting, this is also a moment when um, you are more politically active in your work too. So yeah. my last question to you before we open it up to the audience mm -hmm. is, um, can you talk to us about some of the things that you are deeply concerned with in the world? And now? Yeah, so. Trauma. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it doesn't have to be one word, but. <laughs> I mean, I almost see this exhibition as an anecdote to Trump. You know, this isn't false news. You know, um, I'm horrified that he's president. And I keep thinking if Obama did one millionth of what he's done, they would have killed him, yeah. you know? And he, every day is a disaster. And the fact that his, his supporters are right there with him, no matter how stupid he sounds, no matter how dangerous he is, they stay with him. So it. Okay, there's another side of it. I noticed a couple of years ago, a lot of the young African-American students were annoyed at their elders for talking about racism, for talking about the civil rights movement. It was like, I remember when going to a conference uh, where my fathers were being honored with other people in, in um, Maryland. And a young woman at the end of the conference got up and she said, I don't wanna hear about this anymore, it's over. Forget about it. And I thought, hmm, Trump. <laughs> Trump is going to wake them up. Because even the NAACP had released a document saying that people going to um, 
Missouri should beware if you're of color or if you have any issues of, of gender that uh, they had passed a law there that allows them to discriminate. And I remember myself for the modern going to the St. Louis Museum uh, to condition check the Max Ernst show, not Max Ernst, uh, Monk, Edvard Monk show. And um, I remember waiting outside of the museum. The museum called a taxi for me and they would drive up and leave. No one would pick me up. This is in the 1970s. And one of the curators came out and said, okay, I'll drive you home, or home, not home, but to the hotel. So, I mean, things are getting really dicey because a certain, it, he's encouraging, like, as Michelle Obama would say, when they go low, we go high. You know, because it's really a dangerous time, especially in terms of our international relationships as well as our national relationships with, with one another and who's empowered. Uh, when I went to see uh, Black Panther last night, the uh, trailers were all extraordinarily violent, filled with guns. And it, I almost wonder, like, huh? You know, th all, this message is going out to our young people as the brave thing to do is to have an assault rifle or to have a, a gun. And then when it happens, it's like, huh, what happened? Everything's fine. You know, so um, anyhow, I think it's a very dangerous time. There is a book out uh, written by psychiatrists that was on the bestseller list for a while uh, where they say Donald Trump, the most dangerous president. And so the psychiatrists are getting together and putting it, you know, in writing. Uh, but I don't know what good it is because his followers don't read. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, so we're going to open it. <laughs> he doesn't read. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will send a microphone to you. So we just ask when we call on you, please do not start speaking until there is a mic with you. So we have one here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, exactly the inspiration that I felt I that filled my soul. So I'm really um, thankful for your talk and your conversation. And um, I am interested in the um, you were curated into the Art Aids America exhibition in Chicago, the separate but equal genocide piece with the flags, which is also in this exhibition. Yes. And I am wondering how the experience of being New York in New York and during the AIDS crisis changed your work in this form of like autobiographical... Oh, because um, I lost 13 friends from AIDS. And then I became very interested in, we weren't hearing the stats about children infants, teenagers who died from AIDS. So I called the local hospitals and they said, well, we won't give you the last name, but we'll give you the first name. So I made the two flags and I dedicated it to one of my cousins who died of AIDS. He was a very smart young man. He went to Juilliard um, and he designed computer programs for Wall Street. He was only 35 years old. And um, he had the experience of looking white but some people saw him maybe as Latino and so, or black. And um, he said that the treatment was different in terms of his health treatment. If he went into a hospital and they thought he was white, he'd get one kind of treatment. And if they thought he was non-white, he got another kind of treatment. So that's why I did the two flags. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Question in the back, all the way to the right. At the very top. Way in the way, back. Way. <laughs> um, so, oh, whoa. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of your art deals with political um, things and, or like it has dealt with political things and um, I was wondering, and you also mentioned um, the current situation with Trump and just like issues that, um, do you think that, I think that like a lot of the issues with our current political situation stem from polarization and people not listening to each other. Do you think that art 
can bridge um, gaps in a way that conversation can't? Or do you think that art can be used in as a form of conversation that's more accessible or that can make people better see your point? I can hardly hear you. Yeah. The question what, was yeah. that, I to um, the question. Uh, well, the musing first was that uh, the questioner thinks that today's political situation is a result of a lack of communication between people. And she's wondering if you believe that art can be one of those things that engender conversation, discourse, and conversation between people. Well, is that yeah. fair? Is that right? Okay. I think art can engender communication, but I think we have to work on many levels because the art world is like, uh, when I look at New York, it's a tiny piece of real estate. You know, I mean, the galleries, there's so many galleries. And I remember doing a stat once, and it turns out there are 90,000 artists in New York. That includes, though, you know, painters, sculptors, architects, whatever. Um, I think art is kind of a privileged beast, so to speak. I mean, and the art schools have not necessarily been very uh, welcoming, so that uh, young artists of color may attend, but they're kind of locked out of the dialogue. Uh, I remember having a discussion with a woman who was head of our affirmative action program at where I teach, and she said that she's worked in a number of schools around the country, and the most resistant departments are the art departments in terms of wanting to change anything. Um, I think it's very, very complicated because at this point, I think we are in a very serious situation where I think the art caters to a privileged class that keep the arts going, I'll put it that way. In other words, they're there and they can do the funding, but they not, may not believe in one's particular uh, political system, you know, one's belief system. Uh, they may have, you know, they may be part of, you know, the right wing uh, in terms of money and don't want to tolerate any kind of questioning of how this money is made or whatever. So, you know, I think we have to work on more levels than just the arts, um, because there's so much mending that has to be done even with our, in our own artistic communities. Um, I think that the, um, like I'm kind of glued to MSNBC sometimes. Um, Maddow and uh, O'Donnell, I think are wonderful. Uh, and then democracynow.org is excellent. Uh, I try to not shut myself off from the news, although it makes me a little nuts. Um, but I want to know what's going on and what the information is and the misinformation. So we kind of have to be vigilant um, because, I mean, I've been in the process for 50 years and my message is now just kind of getting out. Um, and, you know, there's, it's hard for one person to be able to, um, create, you need a village, I'll put it that way. You need a group of people, they may not even be a group unto themselves, but whatever, we need people to get together and try to figure out actions that we can do. Also figure out things in terms of protecting yourself. You know, when you do take actions, uh, for example, if you decide you want to write somewhere, um, I'm serious, use rubber gloves. Do not lick the envelope. Do not touch anything. You don't know. We don't know what we're dealing with with what we have now in Washington. You know, uh, speak out. It might even be a good time to re-activate um, consciousness raising groups. And it would just, it wouldn't be just women's consciousness raising, but where people get together and talk in order to break down a sense of isolation in a time when it feels futile. Um, because it seems like I keep thinking about, you remember when Obama, when he first was president and was giving a state of the address uh, speech and one of the Republicans yelled at, liar. And I kept thinking, watch out what you pray for because they now have a liar, you know, a, a, a phenomenally insane liar. Yeah, he's a narcissistic, psychopathic, on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> Anyway, so we should talk to each other. You can speak through your work, yes, 
but that's not the only way, all right? Because our arts communities are very small, you know, in, in terms of just the worldwide situation. You know, read, you know, I, I buy newspapers that are left wing, right wing, the Times I was cautious with because they didn't like Mandela because they said he was a terrorist. So I'm careful with the Times. Um, but just try to keep yourself informed and also in dialogue with other people. And I think if your work registers, you know, your concerns, so be it. But somehow try to reach out to others of a like mind in terms of what can we do about this. And definitely vote, but I am concerned about the Russians hacking our machines because we have no, I remember when I last voted, I have no receipt, I have no record, you know. I mean, I put my little piece of paper and it sucks it up and that's it, you know. So um, I don't know, it's a very serious situation and I don't particularly turn to the arts as the only way at that I even would deal with it. Um, I just wanna become knowledgeable and through that knowledge, try to think of what is the appropriate action. That's real citizen work, yes. Yeah. Other questions? We have questions? time for probably one more question, so we I'll have make one sure on there's the enough time here. for uh. Howard Dina. Do you wanna, do, do you wanna go? <laughs> Maybe two. There's also one up there, if we can't find him. Okay, All right. we'll do two more questions. Okay, two more questions. Wow, cool. <laughs> Hi. Is this, okay, cool. So I think my question is mostly about when you, were, when you were working as a curator and also a practicing artist. And I guess my main question is if you had any problems reconciling those two different identities, if you had any, if you had any problem going from the museum administratively to then the studio, and if you ever felt like, mm, just if you felt any way kind of managing those relationships, if you knew, feel like you know too much, if you can get the head out of the headspace of a curator and back in the studio? Well, the thing is I only have been, I mean, I'm 74 years old, and I was only a curator for 12 years. Uh, during that time, I did have the dual resumes, but I would run into strange situations where people would see me as being the modern and not me. You know, if you went to an opening, it was like, oh, the modern came to the opening. The modern didn't come to the opening. <laughs> oh, God. I remember even like Chase, um, Barbara Chase Rebu had an opening, and the modern said, go to her opening, you know, and I did. And she was mad because I sent someone black. So, you know, you run into all kinds of um, contradictions when you're in, the, on, in curatorial, partly too because there are so few of us. Now it's a little bit better, but there were so few of us then. So I really lived in a kind of double world where, in a sense, my art was a shelter from what I was encountering in terms of the prejudice there at the museum. Um, I, I didn't feel that I had any real conflict, partly. I think if they had embraced me and totally and brought me into their social world, I would have had a problem uh, because I wouldn't have any productive work time. But I did, and also I was being heavily informed in terms of what was going on in the art world by working there. And also informed about the internal practice they had in terms of their own um, decision-making process and also who they were dealing with. Like I remember um, uh, getting a call from uh, an art dealer, her name was Bertha Erdang, and she had put up one of her artists, um, Benny Ephrat. Uh, she, I think, was Israeli. And she called and said, so did they buy, because I was part of the acquisition committee process. Um, you know, just we would defend what we wanted to get, and mainly what my boss wanted to get. And um, I remember she asked me, well, did you buy Benny Ephraim? I said, no. And then she just burst out, niggers, niggers, that's all you buy are niggers. Now this is the art world. <laughs> She's more the art world than you can imagine. Now, I think things have changed a little bit, um, partly because there, it's a whole different crew of people now. You know, I'm sure Bertha Erdang, she may not even be on the planet anymore. Uh, but when I grew up during that time, that was kind of the general attitude 
of some of the uh, art dealers. Um, or if you look at Basquiat, I mean, it kind of, you know, he's in the basement painting. There's this almost like a person of color doesn't have a life. You know, they become a kind of like, um, I see Basquiat as a kind of icon, but it's like, I, I, don't, I can't explain it. it. You have to be kind of, almost like a puppet. I almost saw him as a kind of puppet of the white art world. Um, but I may be, you know, I, I may be wrong. I haven't dealt in, you know, in terms of his work and his life, except that, you know, they always show him barefoot. And, um, you know, that he was, I don't know, he was sort of like, mm, I hate to say this, because the Kara Walker thing just, you know, kind of really got me. Um, and I got involved in editing a book with some commentary. It, it's online, um, Amazon, but my, my uh, publisher is dying of cancer now, and I don't know if she's even filling orders. But what I found was, okay, the NEA cut out all funding for the arts, okay? Artists, rather, not other fields. And so it meant that the corporate stepped in with their money. And that's when Kara Walker rose. In other words, if Kara Walker had been there and the corporates were you know, funding her, we would have had the NEA funding another voice. And the way it was, was we lost the NEA. And the only voice we heard was a voice that was not pro-civil rights, that wanted these very uh, kind of salacious images, like a black child sexually abusing a white baby or a, a black child having intercourse with a horse. You have this kind of vulgarity, in a sense, um, that was anti-black. And even the artist herself said she doesn't care about the consequences of her work. So well, she's both saying and she's also imaging. And the corporates kept it going, but there was no counterforce, no other dialogue, because the corporates had taken over. That's a, definitely a, an issue that can be revisited at another time. But I, I was very curious about um, the other side of your work as a curator, because when we look at the work being created at a particular time, the um, the ability of that work to still stand, I think being a curator made you even more keenly aware of the archival nature, the Absolutely. preservation of the work uh, long term. Absolutely. So. Oh, yes. yeah. That's Absolutely. the only reason we can put on a show 50 years yeah. later. That's true. Do we no, still have time for the last question? I became very I think we aware, got aware of archival issues. And we have, oh, sorry. Oh. No, I just became very aware because, uh, you know, I would condition uh, check works on paper, prints, whatever, and you could see, like I remember there was a print the Rockefellers brought, a Picasso for $35, and from God knows when, and you could see the marks of the fingers on the paper, the oil from your hands goes into the paper. And then foxing, you know, which is a kind of mold, I guess, on the paper. Um, just even, like there, there's even like an issue now with those uh, canvases that the students buy that are pre-gessoed. Um, it depends because I have seen the painting crack mm -hmm. like within a year. Yeah, so you're really better off doing your own stretching and your own gessoing. Um, I mean, if you're into oil paint gesso, that gets complicated because it takes you two weeks. Um, you know, you have to you have it dry, then you put on a second layer, you use rabbit skin glue. If you like rabbits, you don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's complicated. Yes, okay, so final question. Um, I thought you might be interested in um, something that happened curatorially with your work about 10 years ago. Could um, you speak a little bit louder your, yourself? Uh, sure. Here? I'm also an artist curator, not at your level, but, you know, do what I can. And about 10 years ago, I curated a show at the Chicago Cultural Center that was about serious artists who were dealing with impairment and illness and disability. And I had called your gallery at the time and asked to borrow some of your work. Oh, we my had, gallery? Okay. Um, the, I don't remember right now which pieces it was, but there were two works that we were trying to get for the show. And we had funding for the shipping. 
And the gallery at the time said to me what I was hearing from a huge number of galleries and curators, which was, we can't show X person's work in this context because if we show it in the context of work about disability, it will demean the work and uh, diminish the reputation of the artist, so we're not going to let this work be shown. I have no idea. Who did you talk to? I don't remember the name of the gallery. And it was whoever was ago? representing you in how 2000. It was many years ago? It was 2006. So oh I don't think we need I, that to that litigate that, but right I think now. this is a really interesting conversation about are there contexts where you wouldn't want to be seen? Oh God, and how yeah. is it important for you, for your work, to speak toward the issues that are a part of the content of the work? Well, I mean, um, usually, I mean, I have a different dealer now. I don't know if you'd encounter the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, I, at one point, was with a dealer, Ellen Stregow. I don't know if it was her. I mean, I had a very kind of somewhat contentious relationship with her. And she didn't necessarily tell me, you know, if someone had asked to put a work of mine in the show. So I don't know how to answer that because I was totally out of the loop. Oh, I don't blame you in any way. I mean, I, clearly you, you weren't part of the decision. Yeah. But it's just, I have enormous respect for everything about your work, but in particular the intelligence that you brought to uh, the accident and how to sort of embody and yeah. represent what had happened in right. such an incredibly satisfying way. Yeah. And I was sad not to be able to show the work. So I thought yeah, I would I let you know what happened. You. I just, I don't know who you spoke to. I mean, my, my dealer is Garth Grennan at Garth Grennan Gallery, and they've been absolutely amazing. I've never had a dealer like this ever. Wow. He's amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. I know there are more questions, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Oh, we are he's completely. Been his hand like crazy. I know, but you're going to have to save it for the book signing. I'm afraid this <laughs> this room is going to go on lockdown in a moment. And so, but Howardina, I want to thank you, of course, for being here today. Right. Congratulations. Thank you.